Hey Bio, uh, welcome to the first video lecture for the class. It's Mr. Jones. Um, what we're going to do today is sort of an intro video lecture. It's going to be kind of shorter um, to get us used to how these are going to go. But this first one is on the characteristics of life, or like what is life? Um, because biology is the study of life, we kind of need to know how we determine if something's alive or not. Um, so what I would like you to do right now, if you haven't yet, is pause the video and get out your skeleton notes that uh, we gave you in class. Um, what you're going to do is fill those out as we go through the video. Okay, so first off, go ahead and take a look at your skeleton notes. You should have uh, two terms at the top, biotic and abiotic. Let's go ahead and make sure we can fill in um, the definition of biotic and abiotic. Because these are two terms we're going to use quite a bit as we go through the, the lecture um, in this unit, actually. So first of all, biotic, right? That's the study. That's um, anything that's we would consider a living component in an ecosystem. If you're not sure what the term ecosystem means, right now it might be a good time to pause and just sort of Google it and see what that means. But essentially, it's um, it's a uh, you know a place or location on Earth in which you have interactions between all sorts of different organisms. And in ecosystems, you can have living components and non-living components interacting um, to create that ecosystem. So in an ecosystem, you can have biotic and you can have abiotic, which are the non-living components. Okay, so make sure you fill those in on your, in your outline. So moving on, I want to give some examples. Um, and on your skeleton notes, go ahead and write whether or not you think this would be a biotic or an abiotic factor in an ecosystem, right? Now, you're not going to know the right answer. We'll go over it in class. But I want you to give your best guess. So first, a rock. Do you think it's biotic or abiotic? Go ahead and write that in. Next, you've got bacteria. Is this biotic or abiotic? Write that in. Next, fire. Biotic or abiotic? And remember, anytime you feel like you're falling behind, just pause the video and catch up on your notes. Next up is a feather. Is that biotic or abiotic? Next, I want you to think about a uh, bone or the bones of a dead animal. So not the animal itself, but just the bones. Kind of a creepy brain down there. And then last is an egg. Biotic or abiotic. Okay, so those are all some examples of things. We'll go over those in class. Um, but moving on, we're going to go over the characteristics of living things. So these, this is the list of things that the scientists have agreed upon that all things that would be considered living would have in common. So let's start us off with the first characteristic. So all living things, dot, 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 are made of cells. That's our first characteristic of life, okay, made of cells. Um, and just some background on cells. We're going to talk a lot more about cells later in the year. Um, but for now, what we just need to know is, is sort of refreshing ourselves on what a cell is. Um, a cell is the smallest living thing um, that we categorize as alive. So it's the smallest living thing. Um, cells have um, a couple different ways they can be around. They can be just by themselves as unicellular, or they can group together to form multicellular organisms. For example, humans were made of many, many cells, not just one. Um, and then I want you just to do a little brainstorm right now. It might be a good time to pause to review some of the parts of the cell. Again, we're not going to go into this in this unit, but we are going to go into this more in detail next unit. So think if you can think back, what are some parts of the cell that you know about? Just a uh, sort of a fun fact down here at the bottom. Approximately 10 to the 11th cells die and replaced each day in an adult human. So basically, our cells die all the time and then are made all the time. So we're never really the same cells. We're always regenerating constantly. And there's an image to sort of give you all the different parts of a cell that might exist. So check your answer or your brainstorm on if you could remember some of those parts. All right. The next characteristic is all living things must be able to reproduce as a species. All right. So that part in the parentheses there, as a species, um, is an important one, and I'm going to talk, come back to that in a second. Um, but essentially, all living things must be able to reduce, reproduce as a species. Um, I want you to think of any living organisms that cannot reproduce. Think about that. Is there any living organisms that you can think of that cannot reproduce? 
If you're having trouble, I want you to think of a couple of things. One, what you see here in this picture, um, you actually see what's called a liger. Um, and a liger is essentially a mix between a tiger and a lion. And in fact, that liger cannot reproduce. It cannot create children. It's sterile. However, just because it can't be it can't reproduce does not necessarily mean that we're going to classify it as non-living. Um, remember, reproduce as a species. Another example that oops, I didn't realize that that was written there already. Anyway, this is a um, I guess you would call it a zorse, which is a mix between a zebra and a horse, and is very similar to a liger. It cannot reproduce on its own, um, but we would still call it alive. Uh, next characteristic of living things that you should know is that they all have a genetic code. And a genetic code is sort of the um, a fundamental part of all living things. And a genetic code is basically the DNA or the RNA that's within a cell of an organism um, or the cells of a multicellular organism. This is a picture of um, chromosomes, which are sort of bundles of DNA that you would find inside of a cell. So like that would be a picture of a bunch of chromosomes that might be in a cell of whatever organism. That's a sort of a representation of DNA. We're going to talk a lot about DNA as we go through the year. But all living things have to have a genetic code. It's basically the information that allows an organism to build itself. <clears throat> Next, um, all living things need to grow and develop. And what that means is basically get bigger or change over the lifetime, right? So a human starts out when they're in the womb as a single cell and that grows and gets bigger and bigger and develops over time till you get to birth and then that once born, it turns into an adult over time, growing and developing. All organisms that we would consider alive or living have to be able to grow and develop in some way. This is a picture of a, maybe um, a growth and development of something really unrelated to, to humans, but again, you can see there's a, a growth and development cycle to this organism. It starts as an egg, and then it goes through the various phases, right? From egg, it goes to something called a planella, and then from there, it continues to develop and goes all the way around as a sort of cycle of life, and it's changing as it lives. Another example is plants. They grow and develop in a very similar way. All right. Uh, next uh, characteristic of, of living things are they need material and energy. So all living things require material and energy in some way. Um, and they need this material and energy for a lot of reasons. Um, and just sort of at, at a basic point right now, I want to introduce a term called metabolism. And metabolism is a word that we're going to kind of go through quite a bit. And I think um, we'll get to it a little bit more later. But for now, metabolism is any chemical reaction that an organism will do, that a living thing will do. And um, you need material and energy to do metabolism. Hummingbirds have a notoriously fast metabolism, so you know they're doing a lot of chemical reactions really, really fast. So they need materials and resources to do those. And then sloths have, you know, very slow metabolism on the other hand. So metabolism can range, but all living things have a metabolism, regardless of how fast or slow it is. The next characteristic is all living things need to respond to their environment. Um, so if you're a living thing, you have to be able to adapt and respond to changes in your environment. Um, think about some examples of this. What are some things that would be considered adapting or responding to an environment? Um, here's some examples. Here's sunflowers. If you think about sunflowers, what they're going to do is they will follow the sun as it arcs overhead. Right. So a lot of times we think of plants as stationary, but they're responding to their environment just like anything any other organism would. It just maybe looks a little different than what we're used to. Right? Birds, they respond to their environment by migrating, right? flying in the winter to a warmer location. That's a response to their environment. So anything that's alive has to respond to the environment. Uh, next, we've got our seventh characteristic of living things, and that is the ability to maintain stable internal conditions. So that's kind of a mouthful. Um, and there's a word that I want you to know for this one, and that's homeostasis. Um, and so basically everything that's alive has to be able to maintain homeostasis, which is essentially the inside um, conditions of their body. So for an example, for humans, we maintain our temperature, our, the pH of our blood and that kind of stuff. Um, 
if you can't do that, you're, you would not be considered a living thing. This is a picture showing an example of goosebumps, which is a response of, that humans have, and some other animals as well. Um, and these goosebumps will sort of be a response to a colder condition, or maybe if, you know, if you're scared or something, it's your body responding to the environment. Sweating is another example too. If you sweat, you're trying to cool your body down to, to the heat that's in the environment. And the final thing, we, the last characteristic is they must be able to evolve as a species. So they, they must be able to evolve. Um, and evolution is something that we're going to talk a lot about later in the year. Um, but for now, what I would like you to know is that evolution is changing over time. So a species will change over time. And when I say time, I mean a long time. I don't mean just a couple days or a couple years. I mean thousands and thousands of years. Right? So as, as years go by, these species will adapt and change to their environment and could look quite different you know, after many, many years have passed. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, say that there's a good point to pause the video. Um, the next part of this video is about the characteristics of viruses in particular because this is a sort of a, a small piece that I think we'll go over in class a little bit. Um, but if you haven't filled in the rest of your outline, make sure to pause and do that right now. Um, and we'll move to this last little piece. So um, characteristics of viruses. What we got going on here are um, a virus which we is sort of on the fence of whether it's alive or not alive because it meets some characteristics but not all characteristics. Um, and so just to give you a little background on what a virus is. A virus is a core of DNA and RNA surrounded by protein. So it does have a genetic code, right, which is one of our characteristics of life because it has RNA and DNA. Um, <clears throat> and a virus works by basically releasing its genetic code into another cell. So a virus is not a cell. And remember, one of our characteristics of living things was it has to be a cell. So it doesn't meet that characteristic. But what it does is it will hijack a cell and use the cell to reproduce. So it does reproduce, which meets another character's life, but it's not a cell itself. Um, and so the host cell will make copies of the virus, and then oftentimes the cell will be destroyed after that. That's, what a pic that's a picture of a virus, sort of a basic structure of, of, not all viruses look like that, but that's sort of a general common structure for a virus. So notice that the virus is kind of meeting some characteristics, but not all characteristics of life so far. It's another virus. So I guess the question is, are viruses alive? And I kind of want you guys to think about this one. I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer right now. Um, but take into consideration a couple of things. Um, what are the characteristics that they have, right? We got to use those eight characteristics of living things to determine whether or not something is alive, right? What are some that they're lacking? What don't they have? I already mentioned that they, they are not a cell. Is there anything, any other characters that they're lacking? And then I want you to think about, based on analyzing those results, um, would you call them alive or not alive? And we're going to go over this in class a little bit and talk about that and sort of try and look at the evidence and make decision for ourselves are they living or not living so that's the end of the first uh, video lecture um, you can replay this as many times as you need um, and if there's anything that you have questions about or anything that you weren't sure about make sure to make a note on your skeleton notes so that we can talk about it in class um, and don't forget to answer those follow-up questions at the very end um, other than that I will see you in class